So now let's talk about what happens when you actually get to do something in the game. When you draw a player faction token. Each time you draw a faction token, a faction is activated and you follow this set of three steps in order. First, you do what's called crisis adrenaline movement. Then you take actions. And then the other player factions are allowed to choose to take follow actions if they want to. So let's start by talking about crisis adrenaline movement. So in this case, the Pearl Security Services faction was activated. And with the, their crisis adrenaline phase, every single one of their faction units can take a move action, which means that it can move a number of areas equal to its movement rating or its foot movement rating very specifically. So the CEO, uh, Martha Winfrey here, has a foot movement rating of one, which means that she can move one space. She could move using any of these connections, but let's say that she's trying to get to the island-wide light and power space, so she moves one space in that direction. Crisis Adrenaline is a good way for you to reposition your forces prior to taking the rest of your activations for the turn. The National Guard faction has special entry rules. Uh, most of its units are not placed on the board during setup, but are placed on the board during the Crisis Adrenaline phase. Every Crisis Adrenaline phase, the National Guard can choose to take one unit from its faction mat and place it on the board as that unit's crisis adrenaline action according to the game entry instructions on the faction mat. So if we look at Private Homer Pyle here, for his crisis adrenaline move, uh, he could enter an area that has a helipad, a beach, or docks and is not compromised. One unit per turn, or one unit per activation, um, and that counts as their crisis adrenaline movement. So they can't enter the board and then also take a crisis adrenaline movement, though they can take actions, which we'll cover now. A couple of quick notes up front before we get into the actions themselves. First of all, the number of actions you can take depends on what game round you're playing and is represented by the red numbers shown here on this game round track. So you can take one, two, or three actions depending on what game round it is. The second important note is that when choosing to take actions, you can use any of your faction units or you can use NPC units. This table from the reference guide shows you all of the actions that a player can take, when they can be taken, and what units are eligible to take them. We're going to start with move actions. When you take a move action, you decide what unit you're going to move and then you decide what type of movement you're going to do. So let's say that I was gonna move this Kevin Blart character, and now I have to decide whether I'm going to do foot movement, which allows me to move two areas, or vehicular movement, which allows me to move four areas. Now critically, if I choose vehicular movement, I have to pay one supply before I can take that move. This represents the gas that you need for the vehicle. But let's say I've done that. I've chosen to move Kevin Blart. I've paid a supply. Uh, I've chosen to do vehicular movement. Now I can move him. And as long as I follow connections, player units can move whatever directions they want and they get to make all the choices as they move. So let's say my first movement was up here. And also crucially here, moving into a space with a horrors unit does not trigger combat. Players trigger combat using a combat action, and this is a very big difference from the way that horrors move and behave. Horrors, when they move into a space with an opposing unit, automatically stop and trigger combat. Player units don't trigger combat, and they do not have to stop. So he could continue his move to here, could continue his move to here, and then he can choose which direction he wants to go in at this fork. And let's say he wanted to go here and uh, protect these civilians from the encroaching hordes of uh, horrors. So let's move him back. One last and very important concept for movement is that you cannot end your movement with more than two player faction units in an area. You can have that during the movement, but you can't end the movement there. So now let's talk about the combat action. 
And the combat action is how the player triggers combat with horrors units. It doesn't happen when they're moving, as we mentioned. It only happens through using this uh, action during their turn. And similar to movement, you choose a character, stick with Kevin Blart here, and then you choose whether you're going to perform close combat, for which he has a rating of three, or range combat, for which he has a rating of two. The other difference, again, similar to movement, is that you have to spend one supply in order to use range combat. Now, there are some really key advantages to range combat versus close combat when we're talking about players, which we'll cover when we talk about combat, um, but there is a good reason why you might want to spend supplies to do range combat. Close combat, as you would expect, can only happen against a horrors unit that is in the same area as you. So Kevin Blart could only attack this unit using his, his close combat rating. Range combat can be against a unit that is in the same area as you, so he could attack this unit also using range combat, or in an adjacent area. So again, that's an area that has a connection between it, um, although it is important to note that it's okay if that connection is damaged. They are still adjacent when that connection is damaged. One additional type of combat you can perform is gunship combat. Gunship combat can only be performed by helicopters or boats that have uh, this red crosshair symbol on them. Most of these are NPC units, but again, you can use NPC units during your turn to take actions. And NPC units, unlike you know, even the army hog here, do not spend supplies when they use gunship combat. And again, the same as range combat, um, it can be against a unit that is in the same space, so the army hog could attack uh, this murder of horrors stack, or in an adjacent space, so the Alyssa also could attack this murder of horrors stack. Helicopters have to be in an area that has the helipad icon, and boats have to be in a docks area. You can see that this says uh, docks in the, the name of the area. It's okay if they're compromised, but uh, they have to be in a helipad or a dock, depending on whether a helicopter or a boat. Next, let's talk about the crowd control action. The crowd control action is the action the player can use to move civilians around the board. And you're trying to keep the civilians away from the horrors and also move them to evacuation points so you can get them off the board. So when you perform a crowd control action, you pick an area where you have both a faction unit and civilian units. So if we look at the board state here, um, you know, the Pearl Security Services is up, and all three of these areas uh, have the ability to do a crowd control action. Once you've chosen to do a crowd control action, you've chosen an area, um, you look at the admin rating of the player faction unit in the area that you're going to use. In this case, uh, it is the green number underneath the check mark. So in this case, uh, Dr. Venkman has an admin rating of two, and that number tells you how many civilian units you can move. So in this case, he can move two civilian units. And you can move the civilian units one space uh, and just following the general, the same rules for players. So he could move, uh, he could move both of these units because he can move two here, which is probably what he's going to do. Um, he could also technically move them here, although that would be moving them closer to the horrors and into a clear space, so it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, or he could move one unit here and one unit here. But of course, that doesn't make sense, so he's going to likely move both units here. Now, if we had chosen a Dr. McCoy, by contrast, he only has an admin rating of one. So he has two civilian units in his space. He's only able to move one of them. So let's say he takes the Latimer dry cleaner cleaning crew and he moves them to the fire station. That's all he can do. Next up, the evacuate option. And this is how you get civilian units to safety, allowing you to score points for them, the points that you have to accumulate if you want to win the game. So to take an evacuate option, you pick an eligible area. So what makes an eligible area? Well, first of all, it has to contain civilians, obviously. Second, it can't be compromised. Third, it has to either contain a helicopter and a helipad, or a boat and a dock. And the helicopter, the boat can't be disabled. So if we go through all the spaces that we've got in view here, uh, we have this space here with a helicopter and a helipad and civilians. So that space is eligible. 
This base has a helicopter and a helipad and civilians, but it's compromised because I have murder of horrors units here, so I can't use that. Town Hall has civilians, but it doesn't have a helicopter or a helipad or a boat or anything. Um, the docks, the Greenport docks here has civilians and the ferry, but the ferry is disabled, so it's not eligible. And then finally, the, uh, the docks here has civilians, the Coast Guard docks has civilians, a boat, and it's not compromised, so it is eligible. Once you've picked an eligible area, you simply take a number of civilian units off the board equal to the evacuation rating of the unit that's in that area. So in this case, the Air Med helicopter can evacuate one unit, the Alyssa can evacuate two units. Now, the value of these units is not hidden from you. So in this case, if I was choosing this area, um, I would choose to evacuate, probably, the Curtis family because they are worth three evacuation points. Let's put it down here for a second. Technically, you move these to the faction mat, but uh, we'll just put it down here for a second. So you choose which civilians you evacuate. You take them off the board and you place them uh, onto your faction mat. That's what this other area is for. And then you come down here and you score yourself a number of evacuation points that is equal to uh, the evacuation points that that civilian was worth. And as we mentioned before, you're trying to evacuate 26 points worth of civilians uh, before the end of the game if you want to win. One final special note about evacuation involves the Great South Bay Bridge, which is a special area which is both an area, a bridge, um, and an evacuation point, as well as being an overrun area, I should add. So units can also be evacuated via the Great South Bay Bridge. To do that, uh, first of all, the area can't be damaged. It starts the game damaged, and so you have to repair it. We'll talk about the repair action in a second. Um, and it can't be compromised. So it can't have horrors in it. It can't have an overrun marker in it. Um, but once it's clear, or if it's clear, um, you can use a crowd control action. So let's say we use Jay Friday to do a crowd control action. He could choose to move this civilian through this connection off the board, which would then allow him to score one evacuation point for that civilian unit. So it is another way of evacuating civilians, although to do it, you use a crowd control action. The repair action. The repair action is used to remove damage marker from areas or bridges, uh, or to flip damaged or disabled helicopters and boats to their functional side so that they can be used for things like evacuation. To perform the repair action, um, after you choose it, you choose an area that has an area that has damage, or an area that is adjacent to a bridge that has damage, or an area that has a disabled helicopter or boat. Then so you, you, know, you would choose the character in that area that you would also be doing it if you had more than one. But after you do that, you choose a fate number. You draw a fate number and you compare it to this table. And you're going to get one of these four results. Either an epic fail, in which you add one to the damage, you've made the situation worse. Or you can choose to spend a supply for the duct tape option and nothing happens. Two to three fate number and you can remove one damage marker from uh, a bridge or an area, or you can spend a supply to flip uh, a disabled helicopter or boat to its operational side. Four to five, you remove damage markers equal to the admin rating of your unit, or you flip a disabled unit to its operational side, but you don't have to spend supplies to do it. Or six, you remove all damage markers from the area or bridge, uh, and or you flip the disabled unit to its operational side. So if we look at Dr. McCoy here, he could either choose to attempt to repair the damage in the area and get the power station working again, or he could try to repair the damage on this bridge. Uh, let's say that he uh, drew the four to five. So he gets to remove a number of markers equal to his admin rating, which is sadly only a one, but at least in this case, it allows him to remove one damage marker from the area, if that was what he had targeted. If he drew a six, by contrast, he could have removed all three of those damage from the area. 
The last thing worth noting, again, gets us back to the Great South Bay Bridge, which is a special area, which is also a bridge. You can attempt to repair the, great, the damage in the Great South Bay Bridge from the adjacent bridge tolls area. So uh, Officer Friday here could do a repair action and could attempt to, uh, to repair the Great South Bay Bridge. He doesn't have to be in that area to do it. Build compound unit. This is how you can bring your faction's compound unit into play. You choose this action. Once you choose this action, you have to pick an eligible unit in order to build that compound. And in order to be eligible, uh, your faction unit has to have an admin rating of three or greater. So in this example for the Pearl Security Services, uh, Kevin Blart with an admin rating of four, uh, Martha Winfrey with an admin rating of three, they both could build a compound. Uh, Dr. Venkman with an admin rating of two could not. So let's say we've chosen uh, Kevin Blart to build a compound in this area. So we come over to the faction mat and we do three things. One, we pay two supplies. It costs two supplies in order to build a compound, it, the compound unit. Next, we add a hit cube to Kevin Blart in his toughness area. Uh, this represents leaving some of your entourage behind to staff the compound. And lastly, we grab the compound unit itself and we move it onto the map into the same area as Kevin Blart. So we place that on the map and now we've built our compound unit. So why would you want to build a compound unit? Well, there's two main reasons. The first one is that compound units tend to have some pretty useful capabilities. Um, they often have pretty good combat ratings. Um, in this case, it also has the ability to heal characters. Um, and so they act as a bit of a bulwark uh, against the encroaching horrors. But the other reason has to do with evacuating and protecting civilians. Civilian units can be placed inside compounds, which protects them from horrors. If there's a horror in an area with civilians that are inside a compound, the civilians can't be targeted for combat, not as long as the compound is uh, safe and remains on the map. Now, the moment you place a compound on the map, any civilians that are in the area with it can immediately be placed into the compound. So let's place the negative Nancy photo civilian uh, into the compound by putting it underneath the marker. You don't have to put all of them here. I could leave this uh, marker uh, free in case I was planning to move it, but you, you can place as many of them that are there as you want under the compound up to its limit of four. A compound can only ever have four civilians in it. The other two ways in which civilians can end up in the compound is um, if they are moved into the area with a compound using a crowd control action. So if, say, uh, uh, Martha Winfrey here used a crowd control action to move uh, this, this civilian unit here, um, as soon as they enter the space, they could also be placed under the compound. The other situation would be if a unit is spawned into that space. There are uh, search cards that will bring civilians and VIP civilians into play. And if that happens in an area with a compound, you can immediately place them into the compound. Now what's crucial about this is that at the end of the game, the player gets to take points, evacuation points, for every civilian that is inside one of their compounds. You don't score them when you put them there. But if you reach the end of the game, you can score them then, getting to your total of 26 evacuation points. So looking at this example, if we reach the end of the game, um, the players would immediately get two more evacuation points for having those characters have survived the entire game um, in Compound W. However, during the hunger phase, which we will cover a little bit more later, Civilians in compounds have to be fed. So having civilians in compounds does end up costing you supplies during the hunger phase. But it can be a really important strategy for protecting civilians and evacuating civilians. We covered these icons earlier. Now let's talk about what they mean, which is when you use a location action. Let's start on the left here with this biohazard symbol. This allows you to take a decontaminate action. Now you remember earlier we also talked about the biohazard track and we'll talk later about how the biohazard track actually works but uh, for now if 
the a decontaminated action allows you to reduce the biohazard level by an amount equal to the number of icons that are in the space. So if we think about the town dump, it had one biohazard icon. So it would allow us crucially to move the biohazard lever level from nine to eight, which means now we're only gonna spawn three murder of horrors tiles when we have a spawn action. The supplies icon allows you to do a forage action. This is a way of getting supplies. To do a forage action, you simply get supplies equal to the number of icons in the area. So in this case, there's one icon. So I could, after doing my forage action, I could come over to my faction mat and I could place a supply, one supply, uh, onto my faction mat. The supplies icon allows me to do a forage action. And when I do a forage action, I, it's a way of getting supplies. So I get a number of supplies equal to the number of icons in the space. In this case, I've got one icon, so I can get one supply, and I place that on my faction mat. The last icon here, the binoculars, it allows you to do a search action. When you do a search action, you're going to draw a search card. So like you do when you're drawing event cards for the impending doom token, you draw a search card, and then you do whatever the card tells you to do. So in this case, I'm placing the Hero of the Day NPC unit by the game turn track, and at a certain point, I can then bring them into the game. So now I'll have another pretty powerful NPC unit in the game that I can use. One of the things you'll notice is at the bottom of the card, it will tell you, often it will tell you that you exhaust the area after resolving this card. Again, you have to follow those instructions. And finally, this is an example where I'm looking at one of my unit's ratings, in this case, the unit's bravery rating. And depending on my unit's bravery rating, it can impact the, uh, the effect that the card has. So as we saw, some search cards require you to place an exhausted marker in an area. You automatically place an exhausted marker in an area when you do a decontaminate action or when you do a search or when you do a forage action. Those happen automatically. Search card happens depending on what the search card tells you to do. When an area has an exhausted marker in it, you cannot take location actions in that area. So with this marker, I can no longer take location actions in that area until that marker is removed, which happens uh, during night turns. The heal action allows you to remove hit tokens from characters, healing wounded characters. This relies on uh, characters that have a heal special ability represented by the Red Cross. You can see both of these units in this case have that ability. So this works in a couple of different ways uh, depending on which faction is activated. So in the case of the Pearl Security Services, which is the active faction, this Compound W unit uh, has the uh, heal icon. It can either uh, use that to heal one hit token from itself or from any other unit in the area. So if there was an, a unit from a different faction in the area, it could remove a hit token from that as well. If you are in an area like Martha Winfrey here with a character from another faction that has that heal capability, but that's in this case not the active faction, you can still take advantage of the heal ability to heal from yourself. One special rule around healing has to do with the, um, the air med helicopter. Um, if there is a unit that is in a space with a helipad icon and the air med helicopter is in the Good Samaritan Hospital space and neither area is compromised, you can simply pick the character up from its location, move it to the Good Samaritan Hospital location, and remove one hit token from that character. This represents the uh, air med helicopter essentially medevacking that character to the hospital and healing them along the way. Very important to note that you can only do this so long as you don't violate the rule that you can only have two player units in an area at the end of a, uh, of a movement. So if you already had two player units in the Good Samaritan Hospital, you couldn't you take advantage of this. Only two actions left to cover, and the first is special actions. 
you can take a special action. And we talked earlier when we were talking about faction units and factions, that special actions are types of special powers that certain units have. So Dr. Venkman here can t attack a horror unit in the same or an adjacent area. He draws a fate number, and on a one, he spawns a new a new uh, horror in that area. Two to five, he inflicts hits equal to half the fate number drawn, and a six, he'll inflict five hits. And the final action is what's called reposition. And reposition is how you will move boats and helicopters to new locations. And basically what you do is you take uh, any helicopter unit that is not disabled or a boat unit that is not disabled. And in the case of a helicopter unit, you can move it to any area with a helipad icon, so long as the area that you're moving it to isn't compromised. And in the case of a boat, you can move it to any area that is a dock, provided that the area that you're moving it to isn't compromised. Now the area they move from can be compromised, but the area they move to can't be compromised. So for example, as a reposition action, I would move this Coast Guard helicopter to that space. Or I could move the Cheyenne Sky from this dock, and it's compromised because it's damaged, to this area, which is not compromised. Now, regarding the last two actions, uh, the special actions can never be performed as what is known as a follow action. And the reposition action can only be performed as a follow action. Now, knowing that we haven't talked about what follow actions are, I'm sure none of that made any sense. So let's cover follow actions next. Once the active faction player announces that they're done taking their actions for the turn, the player to their left is given the option to take what is known as a follow action. They can choose to do it or not. Um, if they don't choose to do it, then it passes to the next player on their left uh, to make that decision. If they choose to take a follow action, they are then given the opportunity to take one action as if they were the active player, uh, but with two notable differences to the uh, standard action phase. The first is, is that they cannot use faction special actions. So we talked about this previously, but you can't use any special action from any of your characters. The second thing is that the reposition action can only be taken as a follow action. So if you want to move helicopters or boats on the board, you have to take a follow action and use the reposition action to do that. If you choose to take a follow action, once you have completed that action, you uh, are subject to something called the Fickle Finger of Fate, it, which basically involves drawing a Fate card. And here, there's two possibilities. The first is that your Fate card at the bottom says, Draw Event Card. When that happens, you immediately draw one of these event cards and execute whatever it tells you to do. Uh, this is just like what we discussed when talking about what happens when you draw the impending doom token. After you execute this event, the f no other players can take a follow action. The follow action phase ends and you move on to, dis to pulling another token from the turn order bag. The other thing that can happen is you can draw a card that says no event card at the bottom. If that happens, then you move to the next player to next player in clockwise order, and they again choose whether they're going to take a follow action or not. And you basically repeat this procedure until either you're forced to stop because of an event card, or you reach the final non-active player. Once you get back around to the person who was, was the active player, then it ends as well. The active player cannot take a follow action. And so the activity phase just continues in that way. You draw a token and you do whatever you need to do based on the token that you drew until you draw the final, the eighth token, from the turn order bag. At that point, you move to the end phase and to walk you through what you do in the end phase now. So during night rounds, and only during night rounds, you do what's called replenished locations. If you remember earlier, we talked about placing exhausted markers in locations, and that prevented you from using location actions. During this step, you remove all of those from the board. So at the start of each new day, locations are replenished, and you can do location actions again. Then you do the mutations regeneration step. 
Horror mutations, the horror standees, get hit cubes uh, in the same way that players do. And we'll talk more about that when we talk about combat. But during this step, you remove one of those from each of the horror's mutations that are on the board. Um, there's one that has a special ability where you remove two. Next, you do what is called the, the biohazard infection step. And I'm going to cover that separately in a second. Then you refill the turn order bag. So you take all eight tokens and you put them back in the bag, shake it up and prepare for the next round to start drawing again. And you advance the game turn marker, paying attention to whether it's a night round and how many actions each player is allowed to take during that round. So now let's talk about the biohazard infection step. The biohazard draw bag uh, is where you place these biohazard cubes. It starts the game with six green cubes and throughout the game you're going to add yellow and red cubes to it. Mostly you'll add them due to combat, but sometimes you can add them due to events as well. When you do the biohazard infection step, and indeed anytime you're told by an event or a card that you need to draw from the biohazard uh, bag, you pull two cubes. If you pull a green cube from the bag, you do nothing. Lucky you. If you pull a yellow cube from the bag, you're gonna increase the biohazard level by one. And finally, if you draw a red cube from the bag, you're gonna increase the biohazard level by two. So let's close out our discussion of the sequence of play by returning to the beginning and talking about the hunger attrition phase. I think it was important to understand a few things before we covered this. But during the hunger attrition phase, you have to spend supplies to feed your units. So you have to spend one supply for every single one of your faction units that is on the board. So in the case of the Pearl Security Services, they have one, two, three, four, five of their standees, plus their compound unit on the board. So they have to pay six supplies. In addition, because they have uh, civilians inside their compound, they have to pay one extra supply. It doesn't matter how many civilians are there. If you have any civilians in your compound, you pay one extra supply. So in total, they're gonna pay five supplies for each of their standees, one for their compound, one for the civilians. So they have to pay seven supplies. Now, one exception to this is the National Guard's Army Hog Unit. This does not require supplies in order to feed it. So we come over to their faction mat and we find that the Pearl Security Services only has five supplies available. That means they are two supplies short, which means that they have uh, two starving units, or they have to have two starving units. When a unit is starving, it means that you have to apply a hit cube to them. You can apply one hit cube to one character only. So in this case, they're going to have to pick two of their faction units to apply a hit cube to. Uh, so Kevin Blart already has one, so let's not place one with him. But let's say we're going to place one with Dr. Venkman because he has a toughness of five and the compound because it has a toughness of five. The rest of the supplies are deleted and now uh, this faction has completed its uh, hunger phase. Thanks for joining me for part two of this how to play Plum Island Horror. Next up we'll talk about combat and how to win or lose this game. Uh, like, subscribe, do all the things, leave a comment, tell me what kind of content you'd like to see, but thanks for joining.